What is up, Facebook Live? I hope you are doing well. Welcome again to Weekdays with Dahadi. I'm in a new location. Really, I would say this is a new location, but this is probably more of the lazy location. It's probably a more descriptive way of being able to say new location because when I say new location, ultimately, I am, I am talking about this idea of being at home. This is my office at home, and here goes Dr. Chip died. How are you doing, sir? Well, Dahadi, I tell you my dyslexia got to me. I type it in 148, 148 instead of 149. It's all right. It's, it's yeah, always. Man. Hey, you got your hair cut. I did. I did. I, I couldn't. I, I was a, like, I was trying to do the whole growing out thing, and it just couldn't. You know, I, I just you know, couldn't do it. So I, I, I'm getting a haircut today. I haven't had a haircut since March. Since March? March. Okay. Well, yes. time. There it is. But I got um, the puff head. The puff head. Hey, it's okay. I was trying to do the same thing, kind of with the idea of the COVID 19, you know, like my COVID haircut and everything, but I was uh, unable to keep it going. I was unable to keep it going. So, so are we on yet? We are on. We are on. So, just I, I, I want you to know we are. This is official. Good morning. Good morning to you. Yes, yes. So, we are on. It's 11 03, Chip. We like, we get on at 11 o'clock. The show is the show must continue, right? Yeah. That, that's where we are. And today, especially for Feelings Friday, because Feelings Friday is always one of those days that goes longer than, you know, than it usually, than the, I, I, I've been telling people, you know, 30 minutes, but I mean, I just stopped lying to folk. It, like we barely get off before 30, before 30 minutes. So it's true. So, but we're going to talk about feelings today. Feelings and Feelings Friday, that's what today is about. And um, you know, I got a lot of feelings. I got a lot of emotions, a lot of things that's been stirring that's been stirring up in me. And so let me say what's up to everybody before we jump into my feelings, because I feel like I do need to kind of lay in the counseling bed, you know, the therapy session today, um, because of all the stuff that's going on. But Sam Dula, Patsy is on here. What's up, Patsy? Sam Dula, Kendra. Kendra's on here. What's up, Kendra? Panky. Um Shamisha is on here. Good morning to you. Feelings Friday, it is. The hottie and chip. Yes. Jackie Taylor is watching us. What's up? Yes. Oh, Jackie. Yeah. So, yeah. So, again, we're every week. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we usually um, talk about feelings today. It's either Thought for Thursday or Feelings Friday. And that's the day we get a chance to get on with Dr. Chip Dodd, who is the heart doctor. He's the, he's the author of Voice of the Heart, Parenting with Heart, Keeping Heart. And, um, I always forget the one. Loss. Huh? The Perfect Loss. The Perfect Loss. Yeah. yeah the per- I, I, that's, that's the book I want people to read, The Perfect Loss. You should have named it Heart. You should have named it about the, the, the <laughs> you, got, you got to stay in your genre, in your niche. The people <laughs> people consider you the expert in the heart. You know, when you yeah. talk about the loss, it's like you're throwing everybody off. You throw everybody yeah. off. But that's the one, The Perfect Loss. Okay. Well, you know, yeah, Chip. This has been an emotional week. This has been an emotional week. I mean, this has been an emotional year, right? I mean, honestly, I, I think about 2020 and I think about like, this must be the days. Like, I wonder what 200 years from now, if the Lord doesn't come back before, 200 years from now, they look back in this time, like what's going to be written, you know, about our time, especially this year specifically. This year is a year of play. I mean, like literally we had a play <laughs> like COVID-19, we've had racial injustices, right? You know, we've had police, the police brutality, police murders, all those things we've had, like it's, it's a ton of things. Like, and this is on the first half of the year. Like we're still in June, we're halfway through the year, you know, and this is after 2019 when so many people was like, all right, we need to flush 2019 down the toilet and, you know, and so like we're moving to 2020 and it hasn't let up at all. And so, I just wonder oftentimes, is this what the plagues were like? I mean, we have, I think we're, we're over 100,000. I know, I think the last check was 125,000 deaths because of the COVID-19 virus, right? I mean, we're seeing all these. So anyway, back to my emotions. I'm just telling you facts that everyone already knows. Ultimately, the racial tensions, the racial injustices, the things that have taken place, and then even seeing how the body of Christ has responded 
has brought me a lot of sadness. It's brought me a lot of anger. It's brought me a lot of hurt. It's brought me a lot of um, sadness, anger, hurt, a lot of fear, a lot of shame, right? And so like it's literally- overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming. So I mean, there's so much in me because as I'm hearing and I'm hearing people responses, it grieves me that people are so worried about nuancing what people are saying and we're so easy about nuancing what people are saying than actually the cry, it, it actually hearing the cry out from people. And it, and it makes me like, I hate being a politician. I am not a politician. I honestly, like, you know, people wanted me to tell people, oh, a whole bunch of things. It just like, it brings, that, that's what I'm saying. And I think the biggest thing, it brings like the, the limitations my shame is that at the end of all this, Chip, at the end of all this, is this like, I have to keep coming back to my own limitations that I don't have the answers. And that makes me so sad and so angry because I want to, I want to have, and I want so many things. So, and, and at the same time, I'm just, yeah. So I'm, I'm wrestling with all of these things. I'm struggling like personally to stay engaged, to stay in the fight, like not go into the fatigue of what it is. And I'm not talking about just simply, I'm tired of educating white people. I'm talking about across the board, the fatigue of fighting against, uh, you know, the system. And, you know, and again, a system is, I'm talking holistically. I want you guys to hear my heart. I'm talking holistically, like that on all sides, right? And so I'm, I'm tired of it and and it, it, it's hard you know um so yeah so there, there there's fatigue now this is not a concession speech this is not a that i'm hoping that i'm just grieving and lamenting but i'm i'm just as ever angry to stay engaged you know in the fight i'm not giving up i'm not throwing in the towel as long as god gives me breath in my lungs I'm gonna keep, you know, and gives me the grace to keep having this anger. I'm gonna keep motor utilizing it, but I just don't see any win in this. Yes. So, yeah. So that's, yeah. I, I guess. I mean, I guess that's for me is my opening statement, my opening confession, and, and, and it's hard. It's hard. I'm yeah. like on all different levels. Like when I when I hear about people retweeting or like tweeting out stuff that we said that is just taking things out of context. Like, I just like, it, it bothers me when I, when I hear, yeah, there's so many different things. It just, it just bothers me. And so I'm just saying like, I just want to stay engaged. I want, I want people to like embrace their limitations, but embrace a bigger God and like, and, just, and, and keep calling people to God. And this, my cry out is to the Lord. I'm trying to cry out to God to, to do what he does and, you know, and so anyway, I, I don't know if that's all coherent, but that's really kind of where I'm at right you know, now. What, what, what you're saying is so coherent. It's just, uh, it's just like wonderful and, and extremely sad and extremely true. And, uh, and if we just roll it back, you said, you know, Lee said, there's my confession. And you said, there's also my, my shame, my healthy shame. You know, here's my confession and here's my shame. My confession is, man, I am really human and I'm really struggling and I'm in pain and I'm looking for joy. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean I'm going to quit because my heart beats for a purpose and with, a, with, 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 with courage and wanting something, but I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, and overwhelmed means I'm in grief. Lament yeah. is the word you used. You know, my confession yeah. is I'm in lament. Yeah. And and also at the same time, I'm seeing like, hey, 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 out there, this thing's bigger than me. You know, there's a there's this uh like this thing is big. This is plague. This is pandemic. This is how it's always been. This is this is one more time. Yeah. This is what's going to be written when we look backwards uh, and 
and, and the hottie, what's going to be written is a lot of the same thing that's already been written. Yeah. In terms of life is tragic, and only those of us who know and experience God is faithful in the midst of tragedy are going to be able to see the uh, more than just the fatal, yeah. more than just the loss. You know, like, and and I think that that is is this that's able to see more than the loss, but it's so hard when it comes to this though because. Like, I just think about all the different cryouts, all the different limits. Like, we're talking about, we're in the midst of COVID-19. And, like, you know, I just think about, like, the the racism that Asian Americans have felt because of COVID-19 pandemic. And, like, I, you know, I, I got a, a text this morning about how they they feel unheard, you know, in, in this time. And, like, specifically, you know, like, and I'm like, I don't... I, I don't want. I don't. I don't want to unhear them. I, and I want and because their problems matter. And and racism, systemic racism, and unjust racism to Asian Americans, to Hispanic Americans, to Black Americans. That that is, you know. But I just. It's like it's when you are constantly having to face your limitations, and when you're recognized that there's so many problems that even my body, that God has given me, you know, to steward and to shepherd at, at Blueprint Church. When even I'm unable and my inability to do that, you know, it grieves me. And it's just kind of like, okay, yeah. there's another thing, like yes. man, and it, and it cries, and it makes me, it it makes me sad. And you know what? And and you you're talking out loud, like like even even your own body, uh, your personal body, and the body of Christ in your own building at your own church. It's like you can't even do that with COVID, for example. Yeah, I mean. Uh, it's Sonia was talking to me last night, like all the Bible programs that people do in the summer for kids, they're not happening. How many people are, 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 are missing the good news amidst all the bad news? How many people aren't getting fed that those hearts are ready to meet Jesus, so to speak, in a real way? I mean, uh, we're skipping a whole year of people. I mean, mm -hmm. she's like, what do you, what do we do with that? And, uh, and so, uh, uh, you're, it's like we, I hate to say it this way, but we, we're all being brought to our knees. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I don't mean in a bad way. No, and it's in a real way. I mean, I'm brought to my knees because it is, is when I, when I think about this, I've been in kind of Christian, Christianity for a big part of my life. I've been, I've been saved since 1996. And since 1996, very quickly, I mean, I spent the first couple of years in a predominantly um, African-American environment, right? A black, more, more of a black denomination, first few years. But in 19, I would say 1999 is where I began to get more exposure to white evangelicalism. In 2001, 1999, I joined Campus Crusade for Christ, even though I was working with Impact. From 2001 all the way to present day, so now we're talking about over 20 years and I'm answering the same questions that I was answering 21 years ago in 1999 about the cry out for minorities. I'm answering the same thing of trying to get black Christians to stay engaged. I'm answering the same thing. And like, and so what you're talking about this idea of on my knees, I mean, I don't have nowhere else to go, but in the midst of it, there is, I'm, I'm still grieving. I'm like, while well, I'm trying to tell other people not to numb out, not to to give up. I'm fighting for my own heart, not to numb out, not to give out yeah. because it is it is hard because it's like how long, how long, God, how long? And it's like like I'm crying out, and you know, to Jesus, to God, to anybody who will hear. But how do I continue to stay engaged in a way that is God honoring? That I understand that in my cry out, I still want to honor my Lord. Because it's yeah. not by any means necessary. It is by all possible means, but I'm continue and I'm and I'm fatigued in it all and just like and it's hard. Yes. And and you you know, uh I, I, I still believe that this is sounding so crazy, it's counterintuitive, but grief is our answer. And then and then that grief comes from answering the question uh globally for ourselves individually. We're answering the question 
f f about the globe. Like, for example, you know, in the midst of all the news that we're talking about and all the things that are actually happening in our very personal lives, 1.2 million people died uh, last year or the year before. 1.2 million people died from heart attack and cancer. Mm. It's like uh, that's 1.2 million lives connected to no telling how many millions of other lives. Mm. Everyone experiencing that loss. Uh, you know, 3.3 million people died of alcoholism last year in the world, uh, just from from booze that are, will be attacked and accused of being weak and pathetic and judged as being uh, uh, weak, uh, like uh, uh, lacking morality and so on. When actually alcohol kills because it's a sickness, a brain disease that takes us over like a possession. Mm -hmm. because we don't know how to stay in the struggle. Yeah. So 3.3 3 million people died not knowing how to stay in the struggle, not knowing how to live out of the heart. 1.2 million people died. Didn't make any difference whether they had heart or not, so to speak. They're dead because cancer killed them. The disease of cancer killed them. Uh, good people, bad people, white people, black people, you know, the whole list. It's no, no discrimination whatsoever. It's a killer. Yeah. The United States of America, even the pandemic of addiction, uh, you know, like hope of the age of addictions coming out in July or August and the, and the pandemic of, of how addictions overwhelming us. So I'm, I'm adding to the present sorrows, you know, COVID and racism, which is always, you know, racism has always been here and sickness has always been here. How long, oh Lord, how long? And and now here we are truly talking to Hadi about East of Eden and West of Glory. So the I mean, question becomes in, in that is for those, like as you said yourself, as someone who has dealt with the addiction community for years, right? Decades, someone who's like I told without for decades, Mary Ann says that it's hard not to numb out. It's a daily struggle. Like, yes. What, what is, is, are you saying that grief is the way, like, uh, be honest in our grief is the way that we don't numb out? Because it, yes. it's so easy for us to kind of turn that default and just numb out. Yes. Yes. Because the, 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 this is so insane talking this way, but the grief is the doorway into our strength. And grief bonds us because grief is sorrow and loss and cry out together. And it's, it's and, and in the grief, we find each other's confession that, that you and I are both human. When, when, when a big, when a mass grief occurs, we can really find each other in so many ways. When like 1.2 million griefs occurred with cancer and heart attacks, uh, that didn't affect us this year. But when we grieve, we actually find ourselves in the same barrel everybody else is in. It may not be my time in that barrel. It may be your time. But, man, you and I are all in the same barrel. Now, it, right now, it's like finally we're waking up to the, the words and language and multiple nuances around racism. Uh, but another thing, a systemic anything, you know, when, when, when it's they instead of me and you, mm -hmm. uh, when it's them instead of me and you, I mean, get ready because it's going to be like a monolithic attack of, 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 of people groups. It's, it's like we go crazy when we get away from where am I. You know, you've said so many times, the question you and I need to be asking over and over again is, where am I? Like you said, like, like God's first question to us is, where am I? I am response able, made to answer that question. And you're beautifully saying, this is where I am today. I mean, I'm struggling. And in that struggle, you're going to find other people who identify with going like, I get this. And it's, there's a time when a, when a warrior a person who's fully involved in life as a warrior, fully involved in, in empathy and compassion, and they have the good news in their hearts. They have the good news amidst the bad news, which means they can't give up. 
You know what I'm saying? The good news of Jesus Christ says you can't give up because he doesn't give up. You know, yeah. we, we're in it. So every warrior through defeat and through tiredness has got to put their sword and shield down. And the solution to their tiredness and their loss is grief. And they need other warriors who may not be in it at the moment, but who can relate to it through being human in it, grieve with them and watch out for them. That's I mean, good. So, Huh? No, I think that's a that's good. Where like you said, other warriors who know who can empathize with them is yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really good. And, and the question becomes is how do you know? I mean, that is that is, and I and I, I guess I'm trying to figure out like the silver lining, right? Is there a silver lining? Are we even supposed to hold on to the silver lining or whatever? Because Patsy, like Patsy, says this, and I think sometimes. Because there are, there is moments of encouragement. She says, "I share all the negative feelings as well, but there have been sprinkles of glad moments. Examples: seeing people of non-color join the movement, or even trying to understand the fight of minority people. No knock warrants being done away with in, you know, no knock warrants being done away with in Louisville. Moments of accountability from corporations, NASCAR." is saying Black Lives Matter and doing away with the Confederate flag. The NFL is apologizing to Cap and his supporters. Gospel conversations are happening. Our family has seen medical disparities regarding sickle cell, predominantly Black disease, um, starting to come to light in that area this year due to COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter protests. Just wanted to list some of the glad moments in the midst of all the sad, hurtful moments, you know, yes. that, Yes. It's like, it's like there's, there's this, it, like all, uh, like cancer patients, when they hear, like I'm recovering cancer uh, person. Uh, I've been in remission for, uh, well, four years now. Uh, and um, like when, it, like if I hear that there's a solution to cancer, mm -hmm. it's like because I know cancer, had cancer, uh, could have lost my life to cancer. It's like I can get what somebody may be experiencing in terms of celebration and appreciation for a cure, you know? Mm. And so I love that we are waking up to addressing an illness, a disease, a racism, and we're waking up in multitude of ways for those people who have empathy mm -hmm. and compassion. We're waking up to the potential for a cure, mm -hmm. but a cure isn't a fix. I mean, I'm in remission. That's all. Yeah. I still have to live this life with the improvement of the things that, that helped me get my cure, but I still have to walk in daily life. And I keep coming back to this, this thing that we, that the only thing that's going to draw us together, the only thing that draws us together ultimately is empathy, not understanding, not, uh, uh, not even just apologies, not even uh, forgiveness, but what really draws us together is empathy that leads to all of our solutions to put us together in relationship. And empathy is, I know what it is to be in pain. I know what it is to have loss. I know what it is to celebrate. I know what it is to be sad. And when we lose empathy through racism, we lose empathy through judgmentalism. We lose empathy through they versus me and you. You know what I'm saying by they, they, yeah. they are, they this, they that, them. When we get into they, them, and, and you know that, then we've lost empathy because we're talking about, they're not people anymore. They is not people. Mm -hmm. They is not a relationship. They is a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So when we get into they, we're, we're buying into racism ourselves, all of us. So let's talk about that a little bit because I do hear a lot of they and them. Right all, on all sides, right? Yeah. The they was on one end. Look at so and so institution. They are training these minority people, and these minority people are teach believing in liberalism. This, you know, all this stuff. They ah biblical things like you know they're getting more polit political. So it's a they. But then I also see on one side is like they, meaning white people, need to fix stuff. They are they need to claim. Talk about that a little bit because 
How do we go? Like practical steps. How do we go from a they and them to a me and you? Yeah, see, I, I definitely believe in systemic change. I mean, if, if we don't have systemic, systemic change, nothing changes for 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 the the great community of people. I mean, we need cures, we need changes, we need fresh water, we need neighborhood improvements, we need all of these things. You know, that's but that that only occurs change that is a covenant of doing unto others as you have them do unto you only occurs through through empathy and individual care for each other like i've got to have a neighbor i care about before i'm interested and a neighbor who cares about me before i'm interested in uh making sure the water system in this neighborhood works because we need it but it started with me needing it you need it and therefore you know what me and you are a lot like these other people that need fresh water like you know yeah it's got to be tough for them not to have fresh water or and i want them to care about me when they see i don't have fresh water so we together are only together when a bunch of eyes become an us that's good so we're talking about with doc with dr chip died talking about the idea of empathy being the one of the primary cures that we need to have in order to build this connectedness. You and know. so the question is, where am I? Right. So, and so where, where are you? And when you and I start talking, where am I? Where are you? You know, and we're truthful to Hadi. Every time we've had conversations like, where are you? He said, where are you? Where are you? And we tell the truth from the heart. And we, when we tell the truth about our experiences from the heart, we end up having something together when we don't run from each other, we yeah. stay in it with each other. Right. And I love what you were saying, the idea of that when me and you have it and then we recognize what me and you have and there is a they that we need to help create a system so that there could be more of the me and you's yes. that is systemically processed. Um, that so, so dealing, dealing with the interpersonal, but getting to the systemic, but we got to have that empathy and that connectedness in that feeling. Um, but in order to have it, true empathy, you got to be able to do your own work. Your, your yes, own, your exactly. Own work. Like a lot of people will be watching me right now. And, and, and me and you are friends, right? We're friends. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I love what you do. I like you. Heck, you know, I love you. You know what I'm saying? That sounds weird. I love you probably. too. I love you too, Chip. It's okay. You can say <laughs> it. I love you, Chip. Thank you. But... It's like a lot of people are watching me and they're watching what they're seeing instead of listening to what I'm saying. And what they see is they got to ask themselves a the question. Where am I with him? Like, can I trust him? Uh, is he slipping something over on me? Is he just talking out of his whiteness? Is he just talking out of his privilege? The shirt he wears says that he's a certain kind of person. You know, uh, the glasses he has means that he's uh, thinks he's something a certain way. Well, that's you're not talking about me. You're talking about you. So where are you with you with me? And in other that's words, good. like, where no, stop there for me. You said, where are you with you with me? Yes. Where are you with you with me? That is a tongue twister. But I think there's some yeah. profoundness that, that we need to unpack there, because I think that that is because what you're saying is that to some degree, people can easily project their experience of with of other people who look the like they's. you. Yeah, the they's. The they's, who, yeah, that you remind them of, and it automatically triggers a different experience. But that's the very essence of what we're, what we're fighting against because cops may have this feeling amongst minorities, specifically black men, and then they have this feeling that they begin to project on every black man that comes, you know, to them, but they are projecting. And so what you said was, we need to do the work of where am I with you? Where am I with me? Where am I with you? me? With you. Yes. Yes. Where am I with me I, with you? Yeah. Because when I see you and, you know, like, I, like you and I kidded around at one time, like, I, you're, you're a black man. Yes, I'm a I white am. man in terms of the lingo. Yes. Okay, but now, did I just commit some kind of accident by saying you're a black man? Like, all of a sudden, it's like, where are you with me saying, well, you're a black man? 
And like, did I say the word that doesn't fit anymore to describe your skin identification or whatever that mm -hmm. comes in terms of a, a, a people group or whatever. So we've got to be willing to ask those questions. Where are you with me, with you? That's good. Yes, where, where am I with you, with me, with you? Like, so even that, but you remember when I said, if I wore a, like you, like you wear this fedora and I was telling somebody this morning, I was meeting with this, meeting with this great pastor this morning. He's a great man. And I was saying to him, cause we, he was talking about his church is struggling in the same territory that you're struggling in overwhelmed. Uh, and I said, man, this guy, a friend of mine, Dahadi, uh, I'll be seeing him a little bit and, and, uh, see, where's his fedora? And he, man, the, he looks good in it and he just wears it well. I said, Dahadi, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kidding with you, knowing full well, it's like, this is going to be funny. I said, I'm thinking about getting a fedora. And, you know, and I said, what do you think? What would happen if I walked in and wear a fedora like you got? And you mm -hmm. said, don't. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, like, like it's not going to work, right, you know? Right, But But what we're doing is playing around and having fun with, like all of these appearance things and idea things and, and need to be yourself and don't be somebody else. And, and, and it's like, uh, I can do these things. You can do these things, but we're, we're, but we're able, we can do all those things and ask all those questions and say all these things, because you know, I care about you and, and I believe you care about me. And also our hearts are on mission together in something and you can talk to me and I can talk to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so, true. like, we can be truthful with each other, which means we can be in struggle together. And what does that do for me and you that we can be with each other? So what does it look like for us to be truthful with one another, especially when we are in an impaired version of ourselves? So meaning, when, when, so when, like an impaired version, and let me explain that for some people because that, that's not familiar with the languages. What I'm saying is, is that when we talk about the truth of where we are, that we have, we said that there's eight feelings, and these eight feelings can either lead to the gift of those feelings, or they can lead to an impaired expression of those feelings. Because of numbness, because of longevity, because of a lot of things, we go, we numb out, and which ends up being, we end up uh, being able to identify a lot better to the impaired version of ourselves, right? Our expression yeah. of, uh, of an emotion. And so I guess my question is, is that, if I know and if I recognize that I'm currently experiencing an impaired ex version of myself, how can I allow that? How can I stay engaged with you? Because even if it's not necessarily about you, but I'm just in kind of society, things have put me in an impaired place right now because yes. I'm tired of hearing yes. the systemic yes. racism. But now I'm interacting with you, but I know that I'm in an, I know I'm in an impaired state a survival mode how do i how do i stay present in that it, 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 that that's incredible now see it, it demands that we have relationship and it demands that we take time to do it for example like if i'm if i'm in an impaired state with you okay and i say hey dahadi uh i, I right now in this minute i i'm scared I'm scared and that's turning into a lot of anxiety and I'm really wanting to control you to try to, to try to, you know, keep you away from my fear. And it's like, what are you afraid of chip? Well, I'm afraid of, and I name it. And then I have to ask you a question. Are you thinking that Dahadi about me? Are, are, are you like judging me or are you with me or have you pulled away? Are you sitting in your head thinking these thoughts about me or are we together still? So like I tell the truth about myself and when I do that, I pushed right through the impairment of anxiety and control or hurt like I'm hurt. And instead of my resentment turning into denial, hey, look, man, I'm big, man, I, nothing bothers me. But really secretly, I'm making sure that I'm not going to be vulnerable with you. If I could push through the impairment and tell the truth, man, I'm hurting. Okay. So, okay. What if my impaired and I—that's a great, good word. And there's another piece to it too. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Like the way we're way we're made, Dahadi, and we're never going to be able to get away from this. Either we deal with it or we run from it, one or the other. 
the, 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 the executive functioning of the brain, the frontal lobe, the thinking brain, the planning brain, the watching out for danger brain is always asking in relationship, is it safe? Like me and you talking to each other, we're made to say, hey, is it safe? Is it safe? Is it safe? Checking each other out to see if if we can, we're, if we're safe enough to ask the real question, the second question. Our brains are looking for territories that are safe so that we can ask the question of the heart. So the head is asking, is it safe? And if it's safe, I got another question to ask you. And the question I want to ask you is a question of the heart that I'm made, I'm made to ask. And it's, do you care? Hmm. Is it safe and do you care? Is it safe and do you care? And if we, if like you and I found each other to be safe, not, not because of, of race, ethnicity, color, or culture, like we found each other to be safe because, you know, you heard me talking about something. You talked to me about something. Chip, would you, would you share your heart with me is basically what you said. Would you share this heart stuff because my heart's in need of this heart stuff because I know a bunch of people who are hungry and I think this is food to feed. Mm. And like, man, I've been hungry and I want you to have food to feed. And it's like, because I've been fed and I won't, I won't, you know. Mm -hmm. So we found each other safe and then we like, man, you care enough to, you know, you care, you care. It's like, yeah, like we're in together. Yeah. And then, and you still see me as white, I bet, don't you? Yeah, you as about as white as they come, Chip. Oh, one hundred percent. I will never get to wear a fedora, right? Hey, white people can wear fedoras, but you are. Oh, I, 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 you know I can't. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, they don't make them big enough. <laughs> that, that, hey, and that's why I got to go to Goran Brothers is because I have to um, get the big head, yeah. the big head uh, stores. Hey, I got a big head and a long head, but <laughs> but the thing is, like, we have to face that that when we're interacting with each other, even husbands and wives, you know, like even kids are looking at their parents, going, "Is it safe? Can I tell them this? Is it safe? Hey, I need to ask you a question. That's real scary to me." Yeah, I mean that's relationship, and if white people, black people, rich people, poor people, if we could do that with each other, you can't help but have the ministry of reconciliation. That's good. That's good. And that's, we're called, the good news is that we're called to a ministry of reconciliation. That's our job. Amen. Amen. Last one thing I want to attack before we go. It's already 40 after. Time goes so quick. But um, last thing before we go. Staying in the same subject matter, though, what happens if the they that I'm talking about, we've been talking about the they and the me and you, the they, there's a systematic thing that puts me in an impaired space that now I'm coming to you. The idea of this they, it's not even about me and you. You may, this is a safe space, but the they situation, this systemic situation over here impacts me in a way that like it, like it pisses me off, right? It makes me angry, hard, you know, fear. I wanna rage out and I'm, it puts me sometime in an impaired state. Now I come to you, who I consider a safe space to have. How are we able to empathize? Because you may not understand why this is impacting me so much. And so how can I take in an impaired space and not project that on you in our relationship, yes. you know, yes. in, in, the, in the process? Yes. And the way to do that is like, you share, I said, tell me more about your story. What's the story? And then you got to dare to, to risk believing that I can relate. I can re I cannot relate to the specifics of your story, but I can relate to empathy with pain. Mm -hmm. You know, like on some level, when people heard that I've had cancer, four years in remission, I could have died. It was by God's great fortune that he was even discovered because you can't feel cancer usually coming on, hmm. right? Yeah. On some level, they went, oh, man, he might get it. He might get, oh, he might, like, this man knows being human. Right. Okay, so number one. Number two is the way to change a system is when you and I and our stories are shared together, 
and I happen to be called to be moved towards wanting to be a part of your story, wanting to be a part of your passion. If it's just pissed off, well, then we just need to tear it down. But if it's passion, then we need to make some changes in it. Hmm. So me and you together can do, do more than, than, than me and you apart. So that's three and then four and then five and then six and then seven and eight. And it's like we get together, agree that something needs to change and we move towards doing whatever we can do for that thing to change. Yeah. But it still starts with where am I? And that's it's true. like, if I'm not in it, then I don't need to go. But where am I means like, where am I with me, with the world, with you, with, if I'm living impaired, then I'm living alone. That's good. And, and, and I'm going to be harming other people. But if I'm, if I can live with me, with you, then I'm not living alone. And that's the good news. I'm saying still in this moment, reconciliation, Jesus Christ, the, the Christianity has given us, according to St. Paul, a ministry of reconciliation, no longer living in secret and shameful ways. In other words, we, we've answered the question, where am I with me, with you? That's good. Where am I with me, with you? This is going to take some time for us to chew on that, but that is yeah. that is so good because where am I with me, with you is more about me than it is about you. Yes, and where am I? Where am I with me, with you being a black man, with you being a pastor, with you driving a certain kind of car, with you the way you dress, with where you live, with who you live with, with who your friends are? Where am I with me, with you? Am I in judgment? Do I see just a little scrap of certain things and I decide he's a certain kind of person and I put him in a box and I put him in a group and I put him in a they, you know, or do I still, or am I willing to ask questions like, Hey man, this is where I am with me, with you. That's good. You know, like, and the and more honest, some, because that's a very honor, vulnerable thing to be because yeah. to some degree you are confessing that you are prejudiced. Oh yeah. No, yeah, you see what I'm saying? But like, to a degree, and that's what we all want to act like nobody's prejudiced. But the bottom line is that all of us is prejudiced. All we are all prejudging because I'm asking that question: Where am I with me with you? But we're not willing to answer it with that type of honesty. Yes, and here's the thing: we're we're called to discern. Human beings are fools who can't discern. But there's a huge difference between discernment and making choices and and discrimination and ruling people out through judgment. I mean, yeah. discernment is sanity. Like when you look at me, you say, hey, there's a white man. And I'm, I'm listening to that white man talking and what's that white man saying? <laughs> Sooner or later, I, I'm always gonna be a white man, I guess, I guess, but somewhere along the way, uh, these uh, discernments that could, that allow us to pre-assess something are no longer prejudices, they're no longer judgments, there's no discrimination because we're reconciled uh, as being two humans who have bumped into the good news. And we're in that good news. We're made to go address the bad news together. That's good. You know? Yeah, that's no, really good. We all need to be asking, where am I with me with you? That's good. And be, yeah, be truthful. And then what am I going to do about it? That's good. How is God going to change me, grow me? Where am I with me with you? And what am I going to do about it? That, those are the those are words. Those are good words. And I think those are words that are honest words that we need to be able to have to tell the truth about what's going on inside of us and to be true confessors and true repenters um, in, in, our, in our walk and with, with Christ. Yeah, you, know, you, you know something, Dahani, as you, as you sum up, you just you are the best summer upper. And, and I'm, I'm blowing in here. But mm -hmm. like when we think about Canadians, OK, you know, Canadians. Yeah. Canucks. Canucks. Uh, they always say, no worries, no worries. Oh, no worries. Like all those Canadians are saying, no worries. Yeah. They are, there I go. Yeah. It's like, I've, I've ruled out any Canadian being different from that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so that's not the truth. Though there may be some truths in it, that's not the truth. So I can discern from it, but am I discerning to keep looking for the person? Or to discriminate, and then therefore, if somebody's in a group, and I don't know an individual, I don't have a relationship. We need to discern, but not discriminate. That's good. Discern, but not discriminate. Look at you. That's a sermon. That's a sermon. <laughs> you got. You got to go preach it. 
Well, hey, you got that big sermons coming up. Where are you sermons? They're coming. Where are you? Where are you sermons? Amen. Yeah. You guys, thank you guys for joining us again every day. Feelings Friday. We're here with Dr. Chip Dye, voice of the heart, need to the heart, um, voice of the heart. And then the one that everyone, the perfect, loss. the perfect loss. That's the one that he wants you to go pick up if you haven't gotten that. Uh, but yeah, just I thank you guys for showing up, being present with us. Um, again, another day, Feelings Friday. We are going to log off. We appreciate you guys. And um, Cindy says this in our parting shots. Cindy says, these Fridays and these Blueprint Lives have been the most beautiful moments in my life. Game changers. Thank you. And then Patsy Thank Niver, you. Patsy said, agreed. So your labor is not in vain, Chip. Um, you know, we really appreciate you joining us. We really appreciate you guys joining in. Just again, what we're trying to do is create honest conversations, truthful conversations where we can be biblical and balanced and we can build that empathy bone right in us as we talked about so that we can be connected and we can be better at answering the question of where am i with me with you where am i with me with you and i think that is it because we are constantly prejudging and i think that that is a beautiful thing and so the better we are at answering that question where am i and then where am i with me with you is oh that's great that's another question to add to our arsenal what do i need in light of that is another so we appreciate you guys until Sunday, remember this this week, um, on this Sunday, we're continuing our cry out series and we're, we're excited. Last week we had an all white panel. This week we have an all black panel. And in two weeks we have a multi-ethnic panel. And so for all of my, my Asian brothers and sisters out there, like I, we, we definitely want to hear your cry out, Hispanic, Indian, all of my friends out there, your pain and your concerns is just as they're they're they're, pro they're powerful. I don't I hate to make this a binary issue, but this is just something that we felt a need to talk about. We we're not trying to do it at the exclusion of other people, but we 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 want to give everybody a platform. We want to give everybody a voice. I love you guys. I appreciate you. And we're, until Sunday, um, let's continue to use everything that we have to cry out both to one another and to God. All right, but we gotta be honest in that cry out. Love you guys.